to the Notion Club. With me today is the marvelous Ethan. Hello, everybody. Um, so today we'll be discussing the roots of Halloween and going over some weird facts about this holiday. Um, but first, Ethan and I would love to share some personal experiences concerning Halloween today. That's right. I have um, a little bit more of a negative slant on it. Um, <laughs> Raya, what, what personal uh, experiences and feelings do you have about this, uh, this absurd day? I, okay, so before I did all my research, um, I really didn't have any feelings for or against it. I was just pretty, pretty steady. Um, I like <laughs> oh, dressing you, up. You, you, I was just going to say, you enjoy the day. You enjoy the, the parties and I, hanging out. Yeah, I like, yeah, I like the, the camaraderie that comes with it. I like dressing up and going out and... Yeah, um, I did go trick-or-treating a few times as a kid, but um, we never really did it when I got older. So the trick-or-treating is out, but definitely am still celebrating in my own way by dressing up and going out. Uh, Last year, I actually went to Bucharest in Romania uh, to Dracula's castle and partied there. And that was pretty cool. That was an interesting night. kind of insane. (laughs) Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, other than, uh, well, you should definitely tell us about uh, Dracula's castle, but <laughs> other other than that, what is what is the Halloween party scene like in Bucharest? Um, so, it was really weird. <laughs> um, I went with a group of friends, and we got a and b and we got really, like, jacked for this party. Um, <laughs> I was Alice in Wonderland, and that was really fun. Um, but basically, we had to drive about 45 minutes from the B&B to the castle. And, like, because all of the hotels close to the castle were actually full, like, completely full. Um, so we stayed about 45 minutes out from it, and then we drove. And the taxi driver did not speak English, or he did not want to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very quiet ride and personally like I like when everyone feels included and like everyone's happy <laughs> so I was trying to start conversation and because I was sitting up in the front with the taxi driver so I was like having to turn around and like nobody in the back wanted to talk and I don't know if it was because like we were all like just tired and like kind of creeped out because we were going down some weird roads like um <laughs> I imagine if you're like, headed to Dracula's castle, you're gonna you're gonna travel down some strange roads. Yeah, and and you know the thing is is Romania in general. I loved going there, but it is a very depressed country. Like, oh um, really? You have to be very careful about like what areas you go into because there's a lot of um, uh, muggers. <laughs> <laughs> A no, lot of thievery. Very di- diplomatic of A you. lot of thievery happen- <laughs> <laughs> happens in Romania. Um, so we were just kind of like a little bit more on guard, I guess, um, going there. And so, yeah, so we all like, oh, actually, we split up into two taxis because the group was so large. So it was already weird that we had to be separate and we couldn't just call like an Uber or a Lyft. <laughs> It sounds so, like, white. Um, But we couldn't just call an Uber. What we had to do was we actually had to physically find a taxi. So by the time the guy came, um, like I said, it was a weird drive to the castle. Then we get to the castle, and it was a lot of Americans. (laughs) Of course, of course. And it was a lot of um, uh, other nationalities. Um, The Romanians were chill they were like super cool they have some of the strongest alcohol i've ever tasted um so basically how it worked was the castle was up this really large hill and i got halfway up the hill and was like nah like it's too cold i'm gonna go to the party (laughs) tent like it's open now so you had to walk all the way back down this hill through like this like garden area and then the party itself was in a tent and that's what we paid for 
Um, so we also got the, the paid tour of Dracula's castle, but I ended up not even being able to go there because what happened was my husband, he hates partying. So he took, I was like, hey, can you take my wallet and my phone? And so he took it and then just went up to Dracula's castle. So I had no way of contacting him. And then I got split up from the group <laughs> and I had no cards. I only had my wristband on at this point. So basically like I couldn't have gone to the castle if I wanted because I only had my wristband for the party tent. So I was just like, well, I guess I'm partying. But then I realized when I got there, I couldn't even drink because I had no ID and I had no money. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so so what did my you do? friends... Well, my friends were, like, nice enough. They all bought me shots and stuff. And this alcohol was super, super strong. And they have these weird chasers. They had, like, apples and then, like, these, like, weird um, what, what, dark purple berries. What kind of liquor were they serving? I don't even know. It wasn't vodka. It was not tequila. It was just like this. It tasted kind of like rubbing alcohol. And... <laughs> It was so strong. <laughs> was it was it uh, a clear consistency like uh, tequila or vodka? Yes, it was. Oh, it was clear and like honestly, I, I have no idea what it was. But anyways, the whole night ended up being a shit show. Um, <laughs> I didn't go to Dracula's castle. Um, <laughs> I had to carry a friend on my back uh, for <laughs> a couple miles. <laughs> Couldn't find her hotel. Um, it was, it was a hot mess. And then the next day I was just too damn tired. To... You know what? Oh, and then this I, I just, ripped my... <laughs> this just fuels my fire of hatred for Halloween. There's, there's never anything good that happens on this day. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I got to dress up as Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty you know, fun. You know, you can do that even if it's not Halloween. But it's not accepted, Ethan. <laughs> you just have to set up a party where it is accepted. <laughs> so it's like May, and I'm like, hey, guys, come to my house, and let's play yes, dress up. Yes. Like, that all sounds you, all awesome. All you have to say is Halloween is fucking shit, but dressing up is fun. Let's scrap <laughs> stupid Halloween, and let's do it in May. Okay, so why can't you just pretend, Ethan, to... That it's not Halloween on Halloween and just dress up and go out with me. Um, because the rest of the world is also participating in this atrocity. But and I'll they, pretend they it's not they Halloween. They don't know that you're sitting there trying to pretend that it isn't Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. But you could you could just uh, I don't know where I'm going with that. Okay. <laughs> All right. How about you? Let's go over to your experiences. Yeah. Like so I said, I have no let me, personal Yeah, let me go ahead Halloween. and explain myself here for our listeners. Um, I have a very hard time finding any genuine joy inside myself in celebrating <laughs> the spirit of Halloween. And Mariah, I really hope... I, I'm serious about this. I really hope that you can change my mind about this. Um, as as we get further into this episode, uh, you'll be educating me and our listeners about the origins of Halloween. Um, yes. Because I, I have not liked Halloween for many years now. And sometimes I really do feel like I might be missing out on a lot of fun. Um, and can I, can I just please. stop you right there? Please. Um, so the reason why I chose this topic specifically was not to, per se, sway you in either direction. <laughs> but I honestly just wanted to know about the roots of sure. Halloween yeah, and no, like how it began. I, I honestly am very curious as well. I'm really looking forward to this because, yeah, I want to know how all of this absurdity began. Yeah, because, like, you, I mean, since I've known you, you've had such a strong opinion against Halloween. <laughs> and for me, who grew up um, for most of my childhood and young adult life not celebrating it, has no qualms about celebrating it now <laughs> and has never had qualms right, about right. celebrating it. So for me, like, I wonder, well, maybe I'm not thinking, like, deeply enough about it or... 
and you you're more correct or well you're just completely wrong <laughs> well yes that's that's ex actually my exact uh worry here is because I am fairly alone in my misgivings about Halloween. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> most other people have absolutely no problem with it and love it. Um, hmm. And so while, but here's the thing, while, while I am alone in my misgivings, I do think that my objections are fair and they're not without significant weight. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I also want to give you some hope here because every <laughs> every year I really do uh, constantly reevaluate how I feel about Halloween. Um, mm -hmm. I want to like it. Um, I even wrote this song called Intuition that's entirely about this constant debate that I have with myself about Halloween. Really? Um, it's specifically on Halloween? That That is what that song is about. It's it's fairly nonsensical, unless if you're, like, told that context, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, no, see, it, it never seemed nonsensical. I honestly thought it was about, like, something entirely different. <laughs> yeah, 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 thus it's uh, nonsensical uh, nature, hmm. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to have to um, go back and listen to it. <laughs> so here's, here's why I think I, I do every year tend to reevaluate. Um, there, there is a side of me that, that does argue pro Halloween. Um, mm -hmm. this, this, this argument seems to me the, the best way that I can personally rationalize any kind of excuse to celebrate this thing. Um, th these days I, I have a bit more of a Taoist view of the universe, I guess you could say, uh, rather than the more absolutist stance from years prior, in that what we in the West view as contrary forces, like good versus evil, life versus death, or light versus darkness, um, these things might actually be interdependent of each other in the natural world. Mm. Um these two supposedly opposing forces just might be working together to bring the universe some balance. Uh, the, way, the way I understand it from the Taoists, they, they illustrate this using yin-yang. Uh, I was now, just about to say, is that yin-yang? Yes, yes. Now, I, I don't know nearly enough about Taoism to claim that this position is actually Taoist, um, but <laughs> as this has to do with Halloween, I have been entertaining the idea that evil or even if you don't want to use that word darkness may exist in order to complement light and goodness mm -hmm. um now <laughs> all that being said um i do have a really hard time liking halloween deep down um i, I i've got one foot in one foot out however that foot out is a really heavy one and this may be just because I spent so many years hating it for uh, Bible-based reasons, but I'm not so sure about that. And I'm not going to make any outright accusations just yet, but I do want to raise one question, and I do think it's a fair one. And that is, why does the celebration and glorification of mutilation and gore seem to go hand in hand with celebrating Halloween. Like, murders, massacres, mutilations, torture, <laughs> these, these are all, like, key features that are celebrated in Halloween. Mm. Uh, um, <clears throat> to illustrate that concern, um, I pulled a couple of articles from BuzzFeed, of all places, um, <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> I, I went I'm there. looking down from a high place <laughs> I at you there. right now. <laughs> um, the, the first article title from BuzzFeed is called <laughs> um, 17 Creepy Halloween Decorations That Were Spawned from Sick Twisted Minds. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second article, uh, I guess you could say it's not exactly celebrating per se, but it does help illustrate what I think logically happens in this gory breeding ground that we call Halloween. Um, this article is called 11 True and Truly Horrific Halloween Horror Stories. Oh. And Mariah, I know you wanted to 
touch on two or three of those stories because they're kind of interesting, but I, I want to uh, quickly just end this little rant uh, with, with some, uh, some uh, one, one more quick thought. Um, is, is this a grind your gears session? <laughs> I, I guess it is, yeah. This is my turn to, to rant about people, things that people do. Uh, okay. I've been grappling with a certain idea pitched about morality. Um, mm. It was it was put put out by uh, many people, but among them who who I've been reading lately, uh, Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, mm. and I think they're making a a really compelling argument here that humanity can discover true morality through rationality and reason. Now that in of itself is a whole nother discussion for another time. But yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> uh, but personally, I. I fail to rationalize the celebration of murder, massacre, mutilation, torture. Um, I do have a couple other concerns about Halloween, but I think that that, uh, for me, is the heart of the problem. I, I cannot rationalize Halloween as being good. Hmm. So I, I can't agree with you on the... Um the subject of like why should we or why would we ever celebrate gore and massacres and mutilations and such um that's personally why i chose not to watch the american horror story hotel because it was just to me it just seemed like an over sexualized um yeah, TV show here's, here's based around gore the odd and thing, it was though, like this is unnecessary yeah but, um, but- <clears throat> Again, I'm open to the idea that I'm wrong about this because mm-hmm. these these horror TV shows, these horror films, they have a real following. There are people who genuinely like these things. Yeah. And and just because I don't I'm not willing to say that they're they're outright immoral or they're evil. Yeah. Just well, because I don't get it. So I personally abstained from watching the hotel one, but I have watched all of the well, no, I also didn't watch the circus one. I didn't like that one. I'm okay with clowns, but that one was just weird. Have you ever watched um, a uh, like a horror film? Oh yeah, yeah, I have. What? I don't have it. <laughs> what like do do you get any enjoyment out of them? Um, no, because my heart just <laughs> pounds, and I can imagine it for three fucking weeks. Yes, um, yes. Uh, like honestly, like I yeah no, I don't even want to go there because I was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. But to come back to the thing, I don't like the celebration of gore and murders. And I, 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 I understand where you're coming from. Okay. Um, but. <laughs> but. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this question for you. All right. <clears throat> Do you think that humans in general... Every once in a while, just need to let a little bit of that darker side out. Yes, like, yes. Not, not, not allow themselves to like go and take another person's life. Like that's that's. I don't believe that's correct. I don't think that's right, and I do not think you can justify that. But, um, that's that's my personal opinion. But do you think it it's it, well, it actually could be beneficial yes, for people yes, to yes. let out that darker side. Um, I, I, I probably should have elaborated a little bit more on my uh, my pro Halloween argument. Um, okay. I I, mm, I don't know. I, I don't know how to exactly explain this, but but there but there is a idea out there that um, to be a complete person, you need to be in touch with your shadow side. Oh yeah, as, isn't as, that Carl Jung that is, or that Jung? Is Carl Jung, whatever. Yes, I yes. Say. <laughs> um, Jung. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are multiple ways of pronouncing that um, Swiss okay. name, but anyway, um, yes. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm guilty of selective um, okaying of <laughs> violence, I guess, because that that's the way I justify my love for Eminem's music or Green Day's music. Mm. Is um, okay. It's it's somehow touching a certain nerve that's in all of us. We we have in us this real 
dark side to all of us that uh, most of us suppress uh, mm. to an appropriate level to you know have a properly functioning society. But you, I, I, I do think it's important for all of us to know that darkness that's in all of us and to maybe even be familiar with it. Um, I, I guess where I would... Ma- <laughs> I want to comment a really inappropriate... <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Have no, I, I will not. <laughs> <laughs> Just know I'm thinking it. <laughs> okay, okay. When we're off the air, you'll have to remember to tell me. Um, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, 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 I guess I'm being a little bit hypocrit- uh, hypocritical here, but being being familiar with our shadow side and celebrating it, I think, are two different things. Mm. So the reason that I chose just going into the lore and the mythology of Halloween and where it stems from, which is the Festival of Samhain, is because I really wanted to avoid these deeper questions. So thank you very much, Ethan, for bringing us there. Well, here's (laughs) here's my hope, though. Uh, Maybe by me learning the origins of this, celebration in mm. this day maybe it'll kind of start to make more sense because right now i'm mm. just viewing it as why the fuck do we celebrate this this yeah. doesn't make any sense but if there's a backstory then maybe everything falls into place <laughs> but well, we, we shall see <laughs> hopefully i can answer that question throughout the telling of this tale um but for me <laughs> Honestly, I can't imagine most people just thinking that they're celebrating death and evil. Oh, of course like, not. No, I don't. I don't think that like anybody goes into Halloween saying, "Oh yeah, this is well." A I don't time know, for maybe, mutilations. Yeah, maybe some people. Do. <laughs> I was, uh, so my my grandma's neighbors, I I never met them, but I gotta believe that that's what they got excited about. Um, they hung up just the. the Oh, they're they're scarring decorations, if you can even call it that. Um, I have these vivid memories. Back when I was a kid, we used to go to my grandma's house a lot, and every year around Halloween, they would uh, the the neighbors would decorate the yard with some hardcore stuff. They were pretty sick. Um, I remember there was like this huge, uh, like ten foot Grim Reaper. Um, they mm-hmm. had they had a two realistic dummy human corpses that were bloodied, dismembered, guts falling out, um, eyeballs kind of sagging out, tongue hanging out. They, <laughs> they, they were hanging them by the neck from trees with rope. <laughs> they, they even like went so far as to setting up speakers on their porch that played sounds of like evil laughter and witches screaming. Um, bunch of other oh, things oh, that I can't oh, really remember. Oh. <laughs> Was it like this, you, Ethan? You, you make it sound oh, so oh, comical. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, like, this, like, I can't even believe that people, this is how they decorated their yard. So, to a certain extent, I do think some people get giddy and excited about that component of Halloween. Possibly. And and that, again, could be just letting out a little bit of that dark side. Just just a little bit. Just just for one night. You know? Yeah, just just yeah. one time. <laughs> hey, well... I sound like Stewie. <laughs> you know that you know that novel? That novel you've been working on, Brian? Yeah, the, the one you've been writing for, what, two years now? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Classic Stewie moment. Um, but, but no, um, I guess maybe another pro... Halloween argument. Maybe maybe that is a healthy way of getting out that darkness that's in us. Like I don't know, maybe maybe it's an a uh, a healthy unleashing. <laughs> if if some people genuinely require that, that's a I guess harmless enough way of doing it. Can I tell you about my experience at Hobby Lobby once? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> okay. So I was walking with an ex-boyfriend and we were just like chatting and stuff and there was the Halloween section. I love holiday sections. Like, um, I'm going to be real. I went through the Hobby Lobby section of Christmas or I guess the Christmas section of Hobby Lobby. Let me rephrase that one. Um, Just 
is a shopping excursion. I didn't buy anything. I didn't want to buy anything. I just like looking at things. <laughs> um, so we were going through the Halloween section, and all of a sudden, um, this witch, like, uh, figurine, like, came to life and just literally wrapped its arms around me perfectly, Wait, right? what? Wait, like, okay, c- continue. <laughs> So it it triggers like by motion, but it wraps its arms like around and like catches you. Oh, and my I was God. so stunned, I literally just stood there, like I didn't <laughs> move, I didn't speak. I was so terrified. I just stood there with this dead stare on my face, like this is how it ends. I hope I was good enough to get into Holy heaven. <laughs> shit. Um. <laughs> so. That scared me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, like, that. I don't know why I thought of that, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't even... To this day, I laugh about it. <laughs> I don't even want to know how I would react. Uh, I, I just know if... stood there, and that's how I normally react when I'm truly terrified of something, is <laughs> I don't move, I don't speak. Like, you will, like, I'll get scared and, like, scream or drop stuff or, like, throw things. But that is not my terrified. That's my, like, startled, like, reaction. My terrified reaction is just to stand there the, and, the like. freezing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I can't move and I hate it because if I'm ever in a really bad situation, I'm just going to stand there and be like, all right. Yeah. I guess this is my time. Like, you know, like, I don't know how I would react in a truly terrifying situation. There has been <laughs> one instance in my life where I got so scared that I froze. Um, and I don't really want to tell the whole story because it's kind of traumatic for me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it's the, the one and only time that I visited a haunted trail. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the way this trail worked was you, you walk on this path. And along the path, there were, like, five haunted houses that you have to go through to continue the path. And hmm. <laughs> I, I don't even want to know how I would have reacted to that witch wrapping its arms around me. Because the first <laughs> house that we went in was, like, a um, the theme of the first house was, uh, like, demented uh, uh, hospital or, like, mental hospital. Um, oh. And oh. At, at one point, there was... Uh, so they had, like, real live actors in, in each house and along the trail. Mm-hmm. And at one point, a, a guy jumped out. He he had, like, a, a scarred face. He was in all full makeup and everything as some, like, zombie doctor or something. And yeah. he shoved into my face. He didn't touch me, but he, like, put in my face a baby doll that had, was also, like, zombified or something. Yeah. And... I was so caught off guard and so scared that I reacted by punching the baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, At least you moved. I punched the baby. Um, but then I, I think it was something like the third or fourth house. Um, it, it was a clown house um, that had strobe lights. Um, at one point, um, some trap doors came down and trapped us in this tiny little room with a clown that had a chainsaw. <laughs> and I, it, it was that moment that I got so scared that I, I froze. Um, oh, no. When, when the doors opened, I, I could not <laughs> leave with my friends to get out of the house. They had, oh to, they had to grab me by the arms and, and drag me out. <laughs> <laughs> At least you didn't punch the actor. <laughs> At least I didn't punch the actor and get sued over it. But. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Dude, I I understand that. It's truly terrifying to be like paralyzed. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. From fear. Um that does remind me. I I started to tell you the other day about my experience on the haunted train. Mm. Um mm-hmm. But I remembered more details. Okay. So, um I'm going to go over it now sure. if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Story time. So, yay. <clears throat> um so my friend hit me up. We used to work at uh, Gap together, and my friend hit me up, and he was like, "Hey, I know some actor buddies um, that work on this haunted train in town. I was wondering if you wanted to go." And I was like, "Yeah, I'm down. Like, I just wanted to get out of the house at the time. I think I was like 18. <laughs> I was just like, fuck it, let's go As one anywhere does when you're at this 18. point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we went to the haunted train, and." Um, in my town, actually, as a little background, 
in my town that I grew up around, um, the only thing of interest was a train museum. So nobody would recognize my town's name. Oh, I know where that is. Unless you mentioned the train museum. Then everyone was like, oh, yeah, I've been there. You know, I went there on a school trip or whatnot. Um, So every Halloween, they would do a haunted train ride thing. Um, So we went and... We, I believe we got in for free because he knew actors. And so the beginning of this was a maze. And it was like strobe lights and like vivid colors. And I remember there was this black and white like swirly wall. And it was physically like moving. And I was like, okay, so far, you know, like I'm okay. You know, it's a little creepy. But I think like I was just trying to process and be like, it's, it's only creepy because you're hyped up and you know, you know, it's supposed to be scary. So I was trying to calm myself down and then this man just pops out of the black and white swirly wall because his clothes actually blended in with the wall and he pops out and comes up to me and I was like, nope. (laughs) 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 I I hid behind my friend and I was like, nope, I don't want to be here. And he was like, hey, like, let's get through it. Like, this is just the beginning. And I was like, okay, I don't know if I can do this. And so we got up onto the train. So they had several different trains, and each car of the old train was, like, a different theme. So we are walking through, and each theme was just horrifying. Uh And I was like, all I could say, I literally was like, I'm a sweaty person in general. I'm just going to admit this, guys. I get really sweaty when I'm talking to new people, when I'm hanging around people that I think are way cooler than me, which is basically most people. So I'm just sweaty all the time, right? Um, But then also I get sweaty when I'm nervous or excited or sad (laughs) or mad. (laughs) I just get sweaty. So at this point, um, (laughs) I'm sweating. I'm trying to hold on to his sweatshirt because, like, that's all I could do. I was just like, oh, my God, man, I can't do this. I can't do this. That is hilarious. I I did the same thing to my my buddy Noah for the rest of the the haunted trail when we were going. I held held on to the back of his hood on his hoodie. I was choking him the rest of the way. (laughs) Yes, that's what I was doing. And my friend was just laughing so hard. He was like, I can't even be decently scared because you're just hilarious. (laughs) Okay, one more thing real quick. Um, I, I found this out afterward. The, the actors in these haunted places single you out if you're the one showing fear. They want to scare you even more. And when you show your fear, they single you out am- amongst the group. Oh, of course. So, of course. That's, that's why how it goes. you and I were both picked on so hard. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. That makes sense. It makes a lot more sense now. I wish uh, my buddy would have told me that. Right? <laughs> um, so basically what happened was I was having him just drag me through the trains. I'm like, you know what? The faster we get through this, the faster, the better. Cool. Well, we got to this one cart and it was a kitchen one, right? And there were several actors and I was like, at this point, I was like, whatever. I, I'm just terrified and sweaty and shaky and I just want to go home or <laughs> just go get something to eat. Like, I got really hungry from sweating so <laughs> profusely. Um, I was exerting all that. And... Out from, like, so on top of the the counter, this guy was, like, on his heels, and he just started crawling with knives towards me. Oh, my <laughs> And I was God. like, fuck no, dude. <laughs> like, fuck no. <laughs> and at this point, I just ran. I let go <laughs> of my friend and ran to the next cart because, like, I was anything is better than this guy climbing slowly <laughs> towards me. And, um... After that, I remember just shutting down. Like, I just was not inside my body at this point. I was walking through the cart, and my buddy was, like, super concerned at this point. He was like, do you just want to go? And I was like, it's fine. It's fine. (laughs) It's fine at this point. And I was just so scared out of my mind. I I couldn't even react. And that's that's why I don't like being afraid is because I do not react well. I just shut up. Yes. And I I can't read. Like, I would prefer to scream and punch things. Like, I would have, like, if I was 
maybe braver maybe i'm missing bravery in this maybe i need to go to the wizard of oz for this but um <laughs> <laughs> um i need to get some courage like the lion um but yeah no so it yeah i just don't react i'm just terrified and and now how how crazy is it that we make a holiday of this See, but also I burned so many calories. <laughs> I don't count calories in general, but like I, I probably lost a, a couple pounds with all that sweating. You, you know? know, maybe it was good for me. There are less psychologically damaging ways of burning calories. I don't know if you knew this or not. <laughs> Honestly, I would take it over the gym. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I hate the gym. Same. Um, I hate working out in general. Yeah, fuck that shit. <laughs> Unless it's yoga or running. Like, I like running and I like yoga and that's about it. If there's anything else, like, I would really like to be good at, like, lifting weights and, like, looking like one of those pretty girls at the gym, like, in her tight yoga pants and stuff <laughs> and her gym bralette. Like, but that's just not me. Like, no. no. Like, no. I would prefer to shape shift into a glob and go <laughs> and lift weights and maybe nobody would notice me at this point <laughs> but yeah um no so yeah those are those are my experiences with halloween i think there was one more i really wanted to share with you but i forgot have you ever gone like not to get super far off track but have you ever just gone to an abandoned house because like i did that throughout my entire childhood like, that was fun for me. Um, no, not an abandoned house. I, I have mm. uh, very briefly, like for two minutes, checked out a abandoned um, store. But mm. I, I don't think that would be nearly as creepy as a old abandoned house. Oh, yeah, dude. Like, uh, <laughs> throughout my, my childhood, um, I attempted... <laughs> <laughs> to cross the threshold and cross boundaries, so I would always <laughs> yeah, that's, go to houses no, that that's, were abandoned that's or genuinely schools. Dangerous. Or... See, that was less terrifying. But I will, I will tell you about two occurrences. Okay. So, really sh- quickly, um, one house that I went into with several friends. We literally scoured this entire house. It was trashed. There was papers and books and clothes and just dishes everywhere right yeah and it was there was a basement which was really creepy because it was just like i i do not like basements i hate them um (laughs) um um so yes there was the basement and then there was two stories and then there was an attic part now we went through the whole house and i felt braver because i was with my guy friends and just in general, they're all taller than me. They're mm-hmm. all, like, more muscular. So I, I, of course, am the only girl in this group, and I feel like I'm on top of the world. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm cool enough to run with this crowd. Like, <laughs> and we're checking out an abandoned house. Um, so we went through the whole house. We found nothing. And then we literally were walking out the, down the driveway. And my one friend looked back, and he goes, who is that in the window? And we all looked back and oh, saw God. a pale face in the attic window, and we just booked it. Like, we <laughs> ran so hard. And this ha- this house was about a mile out from my house. Or, or maybe the car. I can't remember if we ran all the way back to my house or if we ran to the car that we had parked somewhere. But it was terrifying. We were like, yeah. what did we see? And I mean, we were, like, checking with each other, like, did we see? Like, we, we scoured the house, right? Like, we didn't see anyone. We didn't see any, like... Like, we heard nothing. We saw nothing. It, it just seemed so unusual that, like, there was someone up in the window. And all of us clearly saw a face. Yeah. Like, it's not like not, one of us was like, oh, I saw a face in the window. Not to be too judgmental here, but knowing your old town, it was probably a heroin house. Possibly, but we we scoured the place. Like it just seemed like no one could have been there. Yeah, those, and, and those guys anything, can be quite quite sneaky. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But the second house that we went to, I can swear someone was in this house. Okay, so what happened we, 
<laughs> this was about two miles out from my town. <gasps> oh my gosh, my husband is home. Can you not do that to me? <laughs> uh, I'm talking about creepy stories. This and is, I'm like, this is I think, the most appropriate thing that could have happened for this episode. <laughs> okay. I do not appreciate your kiss. <laughs> Even if it was on the forehead. <laughs> um, okay, so we went about two miles out from my house, and there was this old abandoned house. And um, my father at the time worked on the fire department, so we knew it was scheduled for burning down. So we knew nobody was there. It was just, like, you know, strictly off limits because they were just about to burn it off or burn it down. Um, Did you go so in the daytime? No, we went at night, of, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> and we we went through the barns. There was a couple barns, nothing we saw in there. And we're like, all right, you know. Um, this place was also two stories and had a basement. And so we went through the kitchen, through the back door. And we were just, we went through the kitchen, nothing there. We went through the family room. There was, like, bottles, like, with pee in it and, like, all this weird stuff. And we were like, okay, all right, you know, just looking around. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and cool. we went down to the basement, and we are like, all right, nothing down here. And then we walked back up into the family room, and we were getting ready to go up to the second story. And all of a sudden, we heard, hello. Oh, and we were like, no. what? Oh, we, no. My friends and I looked at each other, and we were like, uh, we're just staring at each other. And, we're, and then all of a sudden, at the same time, we booked it out the back door. <laughs> and the guy that I ended up getting married to, Brian, <laughs> he was like, what? <laughs> and so he took off later than us. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and my friend Caleb and I, we just booked it out the door. We're like, nope, not today, <laughs> Satan. And so it was, it, we jumped in the car and sped away so quickly. And I think that was the last time that we attempted to break in anywhere. Um, <laughs> well, that's probably good. No, actually, that's Sounds like not. You but... don't really have a very good record of finding actually abandoned homes. <laughs> yeah, but we just heard hello and we we're like we checked the basement what the fuck and then like we just booked it we didn't even like tell the third person that we were with we we're like nope we're oh, out <laughs> so yeah those are my stories <laughs> yeah, but I, so... I am very anxious to learn though about the origins of halloween so uh i i would say it's... without further ado let's let's get to it <laughs> okay the tale of Samhain, uh began over two thousand years ago in keltish ireland to round up Samhain, this was the division of the year uh, between the lighter half, which was summer, and the darker half, which was winter. Now, during this part of the year, the Celts celebrated their new year, and they also believed that during this time, the veil between our world <clears throat> and the other world is at its thinnest, allowing spirits to pass through. Um, so this is where it gets interesting with this belief um, between the veil of the other world and our world being at its thinnest, it does lead us down some interesting paths. Um, yeah, you got to wonder how they came up with that in the first place. Yeah, I, you know, I did a lot of research um, to figure out where they came to this conclusion, and I honestly couldn't find it, Ethan. Um, <laughs> It takes you down a lot. The research that I found, there's mythology between the Lord of the Dead. Um, yes. There's the festival. What? No, oh, go ahead. What specifically were they saying happened when this th uh, veil thinned? Well, so with the veil being at its thinnest, there were spirits that were able to pass from the other world into our world. And... They were all, it was kind of a mixture of spirits. There were good and mischievous spirits that passed through. Um, they thought that fairies could pass through and goats. Um, so it, it really, it's kind of like a little bit of everything was able to pass through. Now, I don't know why they didn't think they could pass into the other world as well if it was if it's like a two-way mirror you know where you can see through to the other side but you're not able to see through from your side um hmm. but yeah no they just believed that 
with this part of the year, um, everything kind of became upside down or jumbled. So um, people dressed up in costumes um, to scare off the evil spirits that would come through. And they also set bonfires within their homes to invite the friendly spirits or the ancestors um, that would come through into their homes. Um, the, there was this communal fire that was said to have taken place at Talatka. Um, and the druids were the ones that actually kept the flames lit. And so what would happen was um, at the end of harvest, the people would put out their fires or sometimes they would work in the field so long that the fires would go out on their own. And then for this festival to begin, the townspeople would go to the fires that the druids had keep, kept lit and they would torch their, um, they would take a torch with them and relight their homes. Um, hmm. This was the beginning of their celebrations. Um, they also celebrated with food that would honor their ancestors. So they would make um, favorite dishes from for their ancestors who would come and join in their homes. Um, huh. Tell me more about these these druids. What what are uh, characteristics, if you will, of, of what makes a druid a druid? So <clears throat> when I was looking up druids, there were several things that stood out to me. They were considered high-ranking professionals. Um, they were religious leaders, legal authorities, lore keepers, medical, medical professionals, political advisors. Um, it does tell, there was one tale that I found, the tale of Dawn. Um, so apparently the uh, Malaysians were the first race to land on the shores of Ireland and there was this tale that the Druids had already been there when Don and his crews had come and the Druids warned them to go back uh, I think it was like nine lengths of wave or something like that and to go back and what happened was Don and his crews were the first to die on the shores and that's why he became the lord of the underworld but you can see that the druids were already there and they were already established and they were already advisors um, so much that these people had actually followed their instructions and then ended up dying um, do you know if archaeologists know at all just how far back these these druids do go then um not that i found okay so the druids were reported to have been literate but through their doctrine it um they weren't able to record their knowledge in written form um i guess for some reason whatever they believed it prevented them from doing so um they believed that their knowledge was only to be shared with those people that surrounded them, I guess. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. There are other cultures that record Druids, so the Romans and the Greeks. Um, I believe the earliest known reference to the Druid state is the 4th century BCE. Uh, the oldest description comes from Julius Caesar's commentary, um, De Bello Gal Gallico which is 50s BCE. Um, sorry, I cannot pronounce that. <laughs> they, they probably did uh, battle then, I would imagine, with, with the Druids. Possibly. I do remember when I was going through high school, um, the Germanic Druids, um, they, sure. had, they had encouraged the Germans or the Germanic Europeans to um, not allow the Romans to come in and take their territory. And I believe that they also um, were against the spread of Christianity later on. So I can imagine there was something... And, and the other day you kind of offhand mentioned to me that 
the Druids knew of Jesus. Yes, they. so it was recorded in about 750 CE. The word Druid appears in a poem by Blathmic, um, who wrote about Jesus, saying that he was better than a prophet, more knowledgeable than every Druid. A king was a bishop and a complete sage. Um, so I do not think it was a Druid who said that, but... Um, the druid first reappears in a poem later on and it was surrounding jesus so i don't know if the druids personally um knew about them but something that does come to mind now is uh the three wise men i would consider them similar to druids if you will because they were um political advisors uh they were sages um, they tracked the stars. I was just going to say and astrologers. I do know the, yeah, they, they do, um, the druids are similar in that way where they would pay attention to the seasons and the stars and the world around. Yeah. They were more connected with nature, I believe. Well, the, the druids, um, if I'm not mistaken, are widely to believe to be the, the creators of Stonehenge. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And, Weren't and, you telling me a little bit about that the other day? Yeah, let me uh, maybe just do a quick Wikipedia search here because I don't want to say anything false. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the druids, they just seem to pop up. I would love to do uh, a podcast at some point based around what we do know of the druids because, I mean, since I could remember, they've, po- they've popped up throughout folk tales and mythology history and literature and yeah, yeah. i've always read on the darker side of the druids like the germanic druids they would have festivals right. where they would take criminals and put them into baskets and burn them alive as offering to the gods um, i i'm also somewhat familiar with that side of the story as well yeah like but, when when i hear the word druid that that's kind of like like the occult yes mm-hmm. um stuff like that yeah, you always think of something darker, but when I was looking up um, online, like the definition between a druid, there was so much more to it, and I was, it was very curious. Something that I did come to think about was the druids themselves, um, since in this telling of Don, and I would love to discuss that a little later on, the druids were already on the land, and they were already advising Don and his crew what to do. Mm. Um, it made me think of the Nephilim, if sure. you will. Sure, sure. Um, in the Bible, it talks about the sons of God and the daughters of Eve intermingling and then creating these giant-like um, creatures. But they were wise, and they showed men like... Or was it the the offspring or was it the the sons of god that um showed the people so yeah in in the in the book of enoch which was part of the the dead sea scrolls um after or i think it's actually before before it gets into all the stuff about the offspring of of the fallen angels and human women mm-hmm. Uh, eventually becoming 100-foot giants, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Um, but it also talks about the the angels showed mankind different uh, skills, if you will. Like, they're supposedly the ones that showed humankind how to make weapons and to, like, fashion steel. Yes, and didn't they also teach them black magic, though, or something yes, like yes. that? Yes, yes, that's another... Each angel I, yeah I, oh th- it'd be worth looking up and doing a whole podcast on on the book of enoch it's so weird it's so yes, bizarre yes that would be but so like fun. yes there were a number of angels like something like five and each one like had a specific skill that they taught people and and one of the angels taught man black magic hmm See, that's where I I started to think about because I remember hearing or reading uh, when we first discussed Nephilim, like, what was it, two years ago now, Ethan? <laughs> Something like that, yeah, um, yeah. It's such a curious thing that it's it's so briefly in the Bible, but it's there. In Genesis, yeah. I, I don't remember the exact 
chapter and verse, but I just actually, before the story of Noah. Do you know it? Yeah, it's actually Genesis six, uh, six one through four is where they six, one through four. um they mention it. It's just a blip. It's just mm-hmm. a tiny little blip, but it's there. Um, the the real in depth information is in this uh, book of Enoch, and mm. it's it's a really fun read. It's it's so out there that it's just fun. Yeah. Um, but no, like I I kind of get the same in, images in my head uh, when I hear about druids too. Yeah. Do you remember when we, when we went to Stonehenge? Um, I remember there was kind of a a tourist sign in front of the stones that was talking about human sacrifice, and they were trying to say like there's absolutely no way we can know based on the stones that were found here if they did but they were saying it's definitely possible just the way some stones were kind of situated like this could have been a a killing rock oh Um, yes like stonehenge could have been used for human sacrifice to the gods that 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 could have been going on in addition to how they're lined up uh Mm -hmm. to tell the uh, different differentiate the seasons i think they also line up with the stars somehow yes Um, yeah and then i i'm sure you'll remember this scattered everywhere are these gigantic mounds that are burial grounds Mm -hmm. those Um, were everywhere definitely some religious stuff i would say happened around there Uh, oh yeah i i looked this up and i think i forgot to read it uh this is from stonehenge's website about Mm. stonehenge.info one of the most popular beliefs was that Stonehenge was built by the Druids. These high priests of the Celts constructed it for sacrificial ceremonies. Hmm. Uh, it was John Aubrey who first linked Stonehenge to the Druids. Hmm. Yeah, I would definitely think it would come from them. Another thing, though, too, is they did think at one point there were giants that moved those stones, didn't they? Do you remember reading a sign about that as well? Yes, um... Just personally, to me, the the one story that makes the most sense, uh, because yes, those those stones are I forget how many tons each, multiple. They're mm-hmm. heavy ass rocks, and they they come from one of the shores of Wales, or I I don't remember where exactly, but it's like a hundred miles away or something like that. Yeah, there's two sets of stones. There's a blue stone, I remember, which was the smaller stones incorporated yes, in yes. Stonehenge. And those had come from over 100 miles um, away. And they were still large enough to make people, archaeologists and historians, go, what? Like, how did these get here? Um, the larger ones, I believe they were still a good distance away, and they actually had to physically be brought up there. Don't you remember... Um, it was kind of up on a hill as well, wasn't it? Oh, because yeah. Because if you look down into the valley, yeah, because there was like, I wouldn't say a valley, but like it was a hill that you would look down and there was actually another piece to it. Um, there was like another altar or a smaller version of Stonehenge, I think a mile away or something like that. And then just like you yes, said, there were yes, burial yes. mounds everywhere around it. And it was so interesting. Do you remember how we uh, spent, what was it, three hours there? Yeah. The average time was like 45 minutes for a visitor, and we spent <laughs> like forever. <laughs> Debating how the giants were to move these stones around. Yes. Yeah. It was so yeah, was interesting. I love Stonehenge. It's, <laughs> and then, it's one of the most mysterious places I think you can visit. Yeah. It felt... It's like... Not eerie, what? but it felt like there was something to it. I couldn't escape the feeling that there was something more to it, and I just wanted to uncover it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then we talked to other people, I remember, and they were like, oh, yeah, we, were, we walked through it for, like, 30 minutes and then went on to the next place. We're like, how? <laughs> <laughs> how? <laughs> some, some people do say it's underwhelming and it's just a pile of rocks, but yeah. nah, 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 there's something special about it. There is. And even the gift shop, that took us like, what, 40 minutes to go through. <laughs> well, it was because we were debating which liquor to buy. Yes. Oh. They've got some good liquor in that gift shop, folks. They had I think mead. we came away with some mead. I was just going to uh-huh. say that's the stuff we got. But then, oh, no, we also got some wine. They were mm-hmm. selling some fruit wine. Yeah. Yeah. They had like cheeses and spreads and oof, so many good things. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. I loved visiting that place. But, yeah, no, um, 
the druids they just pop up and every single time i think of them i i i do think of the nephilim now now that we've gone over the yeah. book of being not yeah. in general so but yeah so um people during Samhain they would um celebrate with the bonfire they would of course make the meals for their dearly departed um they dressed up in animal costumes to scare away the um the more malevolent spirits that would come through and that's actually where we get dressing up today for halloween is um that same past um practice i i guess but you know obviously people the... aren't dressing up with that in mind is to keep so the evil I, spirit I, away. <laughs> I I gotta imagine they were making like some scary wooden masks. Oh yeah, that'd be creepy. <laughs> or smearing like mud and blood on them if or they, something like that. If they think that they themselves can be so scary that they can frighten away evil spirits, they had mm-hmm. to go all out, man. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, spare no that, expenses. We got to get scary. <laughs> that makes me wonder, though. So if they were purposefully dressing up to look like evil spirits, what about their, like, dearly departed that were just trying to come for a visit? Like, wouldn't that have scared them off as well? <laughs> Maybe they had some uh, <laughs> a code word. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they pre-planned this with their ancestors before they departed. Yeah, they were like, I'll wink twice. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be distressing though if their um dearly departed would come through the veil and they would just get one single night with their family again around the family hearth like oh this is my favorite meal i'm back in the home that i remember and loved so much and then they just get it for one night like mm. you know how would that how would you feel about that <laughs> Well, I mean, personally, I I would, first off, question it, (laughs) but you know me. Mm -hmm. Um, Second, if I bought into it, um, it would be kind of important, I think. That would be, like, the the day to look forward to in the year. Yeah, but from what I found, it doesn't seem like they were able to communicate with them. Except the mischievous spirits, they would play tricks on them, which is where tricks come from. And then the treats, um, the family would make offerings, um, like creating the favorite meal for the family members, or they would leave um, gifts and sacrifices for them. And that's yeah. Where the well, treat they definitely from. believed that they were getting visited. Then, yeah, they did. Yeah, they put a lot of thought and effort into making sure that the spirits that did come through were appeased. Um, it sounds like a a, a current modern <clears throat> little kid getting ready for santa to come into the living room leave out a plate of cookies and some milk and tidy up yeah (laughs) make the place presentable for santa like yeah that's really interesting a a childlike belief or wonder in um somebody coming to visit that you can't see Mm -hmm. Hmm. we should look into the history behind that as well that would be interesting See if it all ties together. There's a druid at the back of it going, haha, I devised all of this. <laughs> Christmas? It uh, wouldn't surprise me, I don't think. <laughs> well, I mean, the roots of Samhain are very pagan. Um, it's between that, I mentioned before, it was between summer and winter. And it was between the summer solstice and the winter solstice. And so this this part this time for them being their new year and being the the veil being at its thinnest it seemed to be a very mystical um time for them and and if you look back if you if you get into the literature behind Samhain it seems like a very magical time and it seems like any time they want to impart something important um in telling a tale they'll connect it to Samhain and they'll say around Samhain um something like that because this to them was very very real um Hmm. i think i was also reading so the early christians before um before it turned into all souls and all saints days they had taken this familiar belief and they also thought that 
this was the time that spirits could pass through. So that's why they created All Souls, All Saints Day. And then now it's like a mixture. So now we see Samhain and All Souls, All Saints Day as a connected thing. It's Halloween. Um, hmm. But they used it to celebrate the lives of the saints. So whereas the early Celts, they took it and they, um, they were able to celebrate the life um, of the sun and they were able to celebrate the dearly departed coming back and um, they would try to appease the spirits and make offerings to them so okay. with the christians the early christians they were doing it to honor the saints and then the early celts did it to honor the the spirits of the other world and there's a huge difference between the other world and underworld if you guys um have noticed i've been using other world other world is something that is um it's a place where not only um ancestors who have passed on dwell but it's also thought to be the dwelling place of ghosts and and fairies and the like so anything non-mankind that is where those things are thought to dwell as in the other world, whereas the underworld um, is mainly a Christian um, be early belief. The underworld is where the people go, and it's related to hell, actually. So it's 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 a little it's a subtle difference, but it is very different that you use other world and underworld. Um, underworld sounds bad, yes. whereas other world we don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of like a mixed bag of chocolates, basically, at that point. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> or mixed box of chocolates. You I don't, don't know, know what correct. you're going to get. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Where is that from? Isn't that Forrest Gump? The, yes, it is. Yes, I got it. <laughs> I've never seen that movie all the way through. <laughs> oh, are you joking? No, I kept falling asleep every single time I tried to watch it. Oh, my God. One of the <laughs> best movies ever made. I know I keep trying to it's, watch it. It's but such a good story. It's such a good movie. I mainly know the context because of memes. I, I see the <laughs> Forrest Gump yeah. memes a lot. Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I do see that that quote is, I think it's, life is a, a bag of Life's like a like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get. That's right, that's right. So I was close. <laughs> I might have botched it a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if I got exactly right, but I've seen that movie at least six times. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Great what movie. what draws you back? I mean, not to go down the rabbit hole on this one, but what draws you back to keep watching it? I, it's, well, number one, it's just one of the funniest movies you could ever hope to see. Like, every five minutes, you're having a real good laugh. Really? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Um, but then... The I think the real strength of it though is the story. It's it's such. I I don't even know how what what exactly the moral of the story is, but but the character, Forrest Gump, mm -hmm. has has such a innocence about him, and even though life at every turn is beating him down, and he's constantly being rejected, he just plows right ahead, and keeps his his motives good and leads the most fulfilling life you can hope to see. In fact, so much that it's cartoonish, but that's mm. what makes it kind of funny, I think. Um, anyway, yeah, I think that's the moral of the story. Interesting. Yeah, Yeah, I'll anyway. have to watch it again because... Let's, or let's, I'll let's have to pull attempt out, Let's pull out to... of this rabbit hole now before we linger too long. <laughs> yes, I'm, yes, I'm pulling yes. us out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go down that. No, I wouldn't be able to because I don't know too much about it. Like I said, I've only seen the memes, and I only, like, know that specific quote. <laughs> yeah, you should definitely change that. You should rent it and watch it ASAP. <laughs> yeah, I'll attempt it. Um, I did want to go down uh, the telling of Dawn, though. Um, so yes. within this festival of Samhain, there is thought to um, – so one – also within this festival, um, the bonfire was significant because what the early Celts believed was that they could aid the sun in its um, journey from one side to the other. So they thought that the sun could be 
helped by the fire that they light it would aid its journey and then also once the sun went down it was in the other world which allowed dawn to come through because again the veil was at its thinnest the sun was away it wasn't able to keep dawn in um in the other world at any point th- sure. during hey, this r- evening real quick could you spell dawn for us oh uh d-o-n-n dawn yeah. So I did want to get into that because I just thought that was interesting. I thought it was funny that the people thought they could aid the sun and knowing what we now know about the sun. <laughs> um, and then when I started reading about Dawn, I was like, how did this guy become the Lord of the underworld, the other world, if you will? I, it just made no sense. So I'm going to tell the tale and then you guys can... Um, make of it what you will um but it does actually tie into Samhain and it's it's a roundabout way but it does tie into the tale so um mythology tells us what that when the invaders of Ireland known as the Malaysians landed at Boyne uh which is a river um they made their way to Taurus a hill and ancient ceremonial and burial site near Skern in the county Meath, Ireland. According to tradition, it was the inauguration place and seat of the High Kings of Ireland. Once there, they were advised by the Druids that they could return their ships and sail off the shore to the length of nine waves. When they were on the sea, a great storm arose which scattered their fleet. The commander of one of those ships was Don. His ship was broken to pieces in the storm, and he himself drowned along with 24 of his comrades. He was buried on the Skellig Islands off the coast of Kerry. Now, since he was the first of the new wave of invaders to meet his death in Ireland, and as such, he became elevated to the status of God of the Dead, the place of his burial became known as Tech Don, or the House of Don, and soon became identified with the Underworld or Otherworld. Um, and it does, in the tale, it does specify Underworld, um, hmm. and then there were other stories that I found where it specified other worlds. So um, I think it just depends on how recent um, you look up those tales or how recent those tales were created. But I thought that was interesting because was there no death before Don? Was he the first to land on this land in general? Did they believe that they were the only land? Like... It's such a messy tale to me. It doesn't make sense. Hmm. (laughs) Um, And then also the Druids, since they were already on the land that they were, that the Malaysians were trying to go to, they had told them to sail off. The Druids kind of misled them in this way. In this, in this tale, it seems like they were malicious and they followed their advice and then ended up drowning. And um, it kind of made me, it kind of made me happy that Don could at least come back once a year, you know? Yeah, yeah. What's, <laughs> it doesn't seem like he deserved it. What's your impression of Don's character in that role? Like, was he was he thought to be a good Lord of the Underworld or a bad one? Or one that you should be affair, afraid of? The only thing that I found was he seems to be um, introverted. Or it seems like he just wants his space because um, there is a tale where when he comes back and is released from that abode, the other world, it seems like he just goes back to the Skellig Islands and wants to stay there. So it seems like he's the lord of the other world and once the veil is at its thinnest, everything is released and he goes his way and all of his spirits and sprites and and such go their own separate way through the world so it doesn't seem like he's malicious but with him being an invader he's a pretty hands-off yeah with him being an invader it could be um translated negatively but i never saw that personally i kind of felt bad for him (laughs) okay interesting so 
But yeah, no. Um, and then also within the Skellig Islands, it happens geographically to be just a few miles from the traditional home of Mog Ruith at Valencia Island. Um, so they're neighbors, but both are closely associated with uh, Samhain. And Mog Ruith is supposedly the sun god. So when that sun god sojourns at the realm of the other world, the abode of Dawn, it's again like they meet here on Earth, but they also meet within the veil, the veil of the other world. Which reminded me, um, doesn't Pirates of the Caribbean do that at one of like the fourth movie or something like that? They they flip the ship and they go into the other world. Yes, so that is the third movie. Um, oh, okay. Th- well, it's <laughs> it's such a bizarre uh, movie series in my favorite. Um, they they dive, I would say, into the pirate version of the entire realm, um, hmm. and their uh, king of the dead or lord of the underworld is Davy Jones. Oh, that's right. And, okay. and he sails his underwater ship. He dwells under the sea. But in the third hmm. movie, um, yes, as as you brought up, they they wind up flipping the ship so that they're upside down and then at a certain moment the sun sets on a certain day um they they flash into the underworld which is davy jones locker and you would expect Hmm. it to be uh you know under the ocean but it's not it's in a dry bare desert Hmm. um doesn't that sound similar though to the tale that I just told? Yes, Mob Ruth being yes. the sun god. Yeah, and then there's the other world where dawn is associated with that. It's it's almost the like Lord. the the pirates filmmakers like took this story and just said let's make it pirate now, and then they just yeah yeah yeah. It sounds very similar. Unless the original <laughs> tales of Davy Jones, because I do know that that's not just a Pirates of the Caribbean tale. Um, yes, unless they yes, actually had gotten it from it the Celts, could there be a could there be a link? Do you think it's, between the Celts I tale and Davy Jones? I don't see why not. <laughs> I love that though about history. Like it always seems like there's correlations between one civilization and another. It seems like there's always a no matter where you go in the world, there seems to be similarities, a connecting theme throughout the world. Oh, of course. Yeah. Like um, a lot of um, other tales. I, I don't know. I, I love that there's always a connecting theme. Or like why people are drawn to superheroes. It always yeah, seems like yeah. we need someone to save us or something to save us. And it, it's interesting that we, I don't know if you would call it... <sighs> Well, you know, certain plot motifs are very strong archetypes. Mm-hmm. There's something really compelling about a really good story, and you don't really know mm-hmm. why. But, um, yeah, those those are the mm-hmm. ones that live on forever. Oh, so something that's really come up on my mind lately is why is there always an archetype for a hero? Like, why, <laughs> why are movies like Hollywood movies or TV shows. There's always a hero. What is our drive? Like, do you know off the top of your head, like what is our innate drive to have a hero in any scenario when the majority of us are just everyday bystanders? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I've not thought about that before, but now that you've got me thinking about it, that's (laughs) that's deep. I have no idea. Like, it always seems like... For the majority of us, I mean, for myself, I'm not a hero in any way, shape, or form. I've never really done anything in my life that's super spectacular, but yet all of our films, um, books, there's always a hero, there's always a villain. And not only that, the, the hero is like ha- has a, a standard that's so incredibly high, we ourselves know that's impossible. Nobody can be that heroic. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, that's that's like vital. Yeah, it's like a draw. Like we love it when there's a hero story. Yeah. who defeats a villain. Um, that's actually what I found within Samhain as well. Um, there was a common belief that with the light, the fire being lit, that 
the light would overcome the evil at some point, that good would prevail. Um, and that's why they lit that bonfire. That's why the Druids per, um, allowed the people to reignite, reignite their homes in the evenings to keep out the evil, to ward off the evil, but also to rejoice in the, the festival of light and the festival of good. And I, I thought that was so interesting because it seems like it ties all the way back to the oldest recordings of history that there's this drive to have a hero. Yeah, um, yeah. When the majority of us just seem like bystanders. Yeah. I mean, even if you're a hero, like a firefighter or something like that, that's our, that's our traditional hero in today's society. Like... Right, right. It's completely what different from draw? the portrayal of heroes that, that we seem to love in films. Mm -hmm. It's completely different standard. Like, it, like yeah. you mentioned superheroes. Like, mm -hmm. by definition, nobody could be like a superhero because it's, it's supernatural. Mm -hmm. But for but some... But we're drawn that, to it. That's like the number one movie genre right now are, is impossibly great people. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it, it is such a weird thing to think about. Isn't it? Like, and I also remember when we talked about archetypes before. Um, was it the previous archetype when you, or <laughs> archetype, was it the previous podcast when you listed off all of the different kinds of archetypes? Or yeah. was yeah, it a the conversation? 12 the 12 primary archetypes that Jung identified. Yeah, and one of them was a hero, wasn't it? Yes, yep. Hmm. Was there also a villain in that um, in that uh, uh, grouping, or no? Not explicitly villain. Let me pull it up real quick. Um, Trickster, okay. I want to say, was one or Jester. Um, well, if if we're aligning up Samhain and the belief around Samhain, then if there's a trickster element, that would be the trickster element that the people were afraid of. Yeah, yeah. All right, so hmm. there's the sage, the innocent, the explorer, the ruler, the creator, the caregiver, the magician, the hero, the rebel, the lover, the jester, the orphan. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the 12th, the orphan. Hmm. But um, there are many, many further archetypes uh, identified by other people. That's just kind of the first that that Jung hypothesized. But, so, um, I've oh, I've seen oh, I've ahead. seen gigantic lists. Like somebody I think compiled something like fifty. Hmm. So I'm sure you could find the villain somewhere in there. Did Jung ever update that list, or was that strictly like what he hypothesized, and then that was that? Um, I I don't know that he ever wrote down some other list but i'm sure if you like spoke to him about it he seems like the kind of guy who would be like oh yeah there's definitely more hmm. um has he passed he, on or is he yes alive? yes no okay. uh quite a while ago i can find that date hmm. there's there's one um as far as i'm aware really really good youtube video of him just talking about his life i want to say it's like 50 minutes long almost an hour but there's really? like there's like one known video of him and it's it's really cool it's worth looking up um but yes hmm. he he passed in 1961 oh wow long yeah. time ago wow he seems so much more um from what you've told me it seems he like was, more relative he's, and he's like far ahead of his time very very uh Yes, way ahead of his time. Hmm. Definitely an innovator. Carl Jung. Look him up, kids. <laughs> I know I will be because since you've started talking about archetypes and Jung in general, um, I constantly see it throughout everything that I read. It's, yeah, it it's really interesting. Yeah, so when I was reading into the, uh, the festival of Samhain, I was just, I continued to see like, Wow, the Druids. That that was really what stuck out to me was the Druids. Like they seem to be um 
They never seem to be kings or uh, leaders. They always seem to be in the background and they mm. always seem to be helping make decisions um, or give advice. And so that just kept coming up to me as like a sage or a, um, a magician for one with the earlier uh, research that I had done in high school around uh, druids. But yeah, I don't know. It just kept coming back to me. So thank you. Thanks yeah, for sharing, yeah. Ethan. <laughs> I, well, I, I, it's, it's like the thing about mythology, I think, that makes mythology so um, interesting and weirdly relatable. Mm-hmm. You, you find the, all the common themes in, in mythology, they're, they're so similar. Yeah. I think that's why I'm so drawn, with, drawn to mythology um, yeah, I think that's as it. a whole. Mm-hmm. It, it, it connects us back to the past. And I wouldn't say it feels homey, but it feels good to look back and see commonalities between here and then. And, um, I mean, to be honest, I don't look at a uh, a mythological tale and say, this is outrageous. You know, I can't believe they believed this. Um, Mm. It seems wholesome. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it seems Mm -hmm. like, um, you know, even if it can't, even if it is unbelievable, it seems important and Mm -hmm. there's always a lesson behind it there's always something you can learn from the telling and i love that it's lasted this long thousands of years you know even the malaysians who landed on um in ireland two over two thousand years ago is when this began the early celts um we still know about it today through word of mouth and the passing on of mythology and tales in general. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. I love yeah. it. You know, um, if it really was just ridiculous, it would have passed away. Right. I would hope so, but yeah. who knows <laughs> when, when you've got something good, I, I think it stays. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least it's worth paying attention to to learn from or to um, use as a guide throughout life. Yeah. So. Hey, guys. Uh, we had to take a short break. Some things needed to be done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I needed to get some more uh, drink in me. So before, I was drinking vodka with emergency because I had no mixers. And like then... a boss. <laughs> and I do not want to drink vodka straight because I just, I just don't want to. I'm 25. I'm too old for that straight <laughs> liquor shit. What what um, brand of vodka is this? I don't even. I think it's Seagram's. Or is that, uh, is that a brand of vodka? Okay. Yes, yes. Or is that yes. gin that I'm thinking of? I don't know. I think they do both, but yeah, I know okay. it. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It just best. has a red cap on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a really cheap brand, so it's, you know, that kind of like bad vodka. So. Again, I don't want to drink it straight, so I had to go in my fridge for something other than emergency. Um, so I found coconut milk and vanilla and vodka, and um, I'm hoping it'll taste good. That's, I would try it. Sounds like a white Russian to me. It's not bad. It's not bad. Maybe I a little bit sweeter than that, but... Yeah, yeah. It's not horrible. But anyways, um, with that, we forgot where we uh, left off, so... <laughs> We're going to jump back into it the best we can. Hey. <laughs> How are you feeling, Ethan? I feel great. Yeah? <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> um, okay. So, Excuse the uh, chewing. I, I need to eat an apple. <laughs> but I can talk still, so. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, um... So this was a disturbing time for the Celts. Um, They really weren't sure how to deal with the spirits coming through from the other side. They did their best with offering um, sacrifices to them. Um, All I kept thinking of was, Ethan, what if, like, we still believed in this? If we still practiced Samhain today, I do know that there are parts of Ireland that does, but, say, here in America. Um, Could you imagine, like, your Aunt Agnes taking advantage of the situation and telling you 
as a child that, like, if you did not listen to her, she'd come back and haunt you or play nasty <laughs> tricks on you. Could you even, like, imagine, like... <laughs> I think I'm going to start doing that. <laughs> You're just going to tell everyone that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you right now, Mariah, if you, uh, whenever you start being mean to me, I'm going to start threatening come back <laughs> on the eve of Samhain and remind you what an asshole you were. Oh my god, I'm only but lovely to you. <laughs> <laughs> when am I ever mean to you, Ethan? Good grief. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay, so knowing what you know now of Samhain, would you prefer to practice Samhain over Halloween or would you like just oh, real off the cuff Lord, question? No. <laughs> no? Uh, that I mean also sounds kinda uh not up my alley. Not up your um, alley. <laughs> not really. Not really. But it does provide some context. Um what's what's kinda striking to me um about the the whole you know, trying to reach back towards the ancestors. Um yeah. that's I don't know, maybe like why we still do it today. Like may, the, those archetypical uh, plot motifs. What if, like, this is one of them? Yeah, that could be it. Um, when, when something is is real, it doesn't go away. It makes me sad that in today's world, that doesn't seem to be at the forefront of people's mind is honoring the, the dearly deceased or honoring traditions. Um, I yeah. think that's the beautiful part about looking back is, one, mm-hmm. we can learn from mistakes. Two, we can celebrate the traditions that are still well worth celebrating um we can honor those that have passed on and um yeah and i think that's really necessary in today's time because it seems like we're just such a throwaway society um you know with plastic bags and food that's you know it's a leftover so why eat it it Mm -hmm. or um clothes you know i'm not really willing to work through this one issue with my significant other i'm gonna toss them away on to the next one like it just seems like we're such a throwaway society Mm. um whereas in the past cultures have always honored tradition and always honored and it seems like things lasted longer. And I really mm, hope mm-hmm. that with today's society that doesn't really focus on tradition. Again, I do not think that if a tradition is old and outdated and morally incorrect, it should be honored. But I do think we should be aware of it. Yes. Um, yes just so that sure. we can talk through it and learn from that past. But um, We could give yeah, like, the, the future <clears throat> generations a, a reason for encouragement. Yeah. So they can look back yeah. at, at old generation us and go, oh, look how crazy these guys were. <laughs> we're we're yeah, doing so much like, better now. <laughs> <laughs> but as well with that is I hope that with today's throwaway society that we do not lose the beauty of the past yes. and the lore and the mythology and the history. Because to me, studying Samhain, you know, I, obviously you know what Halloween is today. It's fun. You go trick-or-treating, you dress up. Not for you, obviously, Ethan, but you go out, you dress up, you have parties in your homes. You know, it's a way that we can all stay connected one with another. But it's something that also stems from the past and a pagan uh, ritual that later was transformed by the Christians into All Saints and All Souls Day. And then we also find it throughout other societies um, I also do know that uh, when I was going through Samhain, divination kept coming up. So because the Celts um, believed that this was such a significant time of the year, um, they thought that it was the best time to see um, one's future. Uh, there's this um, story that I came across, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, um, There's this belief that if you stand on a church's stoop and look out into the yard, you could see who is going to pass away within the coming year. Um, But people will be warned that you could possibly see yourself with that. Um, I just think it's really interesting that with the veil being at its thinnest um, and obviously things coming into our world, that people believed that the future was easiest 
to foretell during this time. Um, now, I know, Ethan, that we've spoken recently on your cards being read. You actually had yeah. your cards read, like, what? what is it, two weeks now? Two weeks back? Something like that, yeah, two or three weeks ago. Yeah, and I gave you some homework for the female who read your cards. Um, one, I wanted to know if it was uh, easier to read one's cards on Halloween, if there was anything significant about it, if it was more accurate. And, um, yeah, what, what did you find for us? <laughs> yeah, so I uh, should probably uh, back up just a little bit and provide some context. Um, I honestly don't really know what I think of tarot cards or tarot readings. Um, mm. I spent most of my life thinking it was like of the devil. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this is how we were raised, guys. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, anyway, uh, getting back to Carl Jung, um, with my fascination in you know his 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 books and whatnot a few years ago. Um, started entertaining the idea that everybody has a shadow side um, hmm. and should probably even get to know it a little bit. I, I don't really know what the correlation is, but I, I feel like there, there might be a little bit of black magic in all of us. <laughs> hmm. um, and, that, and that is that shadow side of us. Um, and so... Again, I don't really know what I think of tarot readings if if they work. I, I think it's really complicated. Um, you just wanted to but, try it out, though. But you I, to I see just I, I I wanted to see what it looks like in in real life to to mm. have it applied to my life and see what would happen. We did talk about when you first uh, told me about your session. We spoke about the cards themselves. They're really pretty. Um, I yeah, I love yeah. getting tattoos. And some of the tattoos that I've been really interested were interested in were um, based around tarot cards. And then I was like, uh, I don't know if I should get something so controversial because, I mean, one, I didn't know that it was a tarot card because they're just beautifully designed. They have like so much. Every, um, every card is just chock full of really strange imagery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Things but it's that beautiful. just don't make any sense, but for some reason it's really beautiful, and you can tell that it means something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the just just the images on the cards themselves are are astounding. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, <laughs> so just to make that clear, I, I I think that the whole this this whole realm again, like I I kind of have this belief that. If something has absolutely no truth, if it's really ridiculous, then why is it still around? Mm -hmm. And it is still around. And so um, I don't know what to make of it. Anyway, so so yeah, um, a friend of mine, um, I haven't asked her if I can tell the story, so I'll, I'll just give her the name uh, Christina. Um, Christina... Um, reads her own cards every morning she's she told me she's never read them for anybody else so she was like i i don't want you to think that i i know how to do this but i'll, I'll give it my mm. best shot if you want me to <clears throat> um and so i i thought that would be a really good way to have my cards read is from somebody that i know and trust and like um and so she uh she had me put my energy into the cards if you will um by spreading them all out on the floor touching all of them breathing and like <laughs> she she tried to bid me to to put my energy into the cards um and then she wanted me to ask a question to the cards and i guess this needs a little bit of context as well <laughs> the question that i asked um in a nutshell um i was thinking about moving um uh, moving in with with three friends into a big ass house um, south of Milwaukee, and so there it, just a, a lot going through my head thinking about if if I wanted to do that or not. And so I I kind of asked the cards what would happen if I did. Um, and then she had me just draw three cards randomly out of the pile, and I yeah. took a picture of them because I knew I would forget them because they are 
not exactly easy to remember so <laughs> plus there's so much detail in each one as well yeah yeah so i'll just tell you the cards that i drew first i drew a two of swords card number two was the hermit and then card number three was four of wands now for some reason as soon as i put the cards down like a story was told to me before Christina even said anything like it it kind of sort of made sense to me. She did need to explain what exactly the four of wands was. Um, but the two of swords um, from what she was saying kind of represents uh, you're, you're at a crossroads, you know, two, two choices to make. Hmm. And it's like, yeah, sure enough. That's, that's where, where I'm at here. And then, it's kind of sequential. Card number two is where I'm currently at. <laughs> um, the Hermit, <laughs> which I uh, sometimes call myself. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then card number three is kind of the what would happen if I, if I did move. And four of wands, as Christina uh, explained to me, is like, safety comfort security um and then it just kind of like as soon as i saw the number four four of wands it was like oh it's because there would be four of us in this house four of my best friends and, and me or three of my best friends and myself um and then she said tell you what why don't you draw one more card um to get like a a, a further view of the future so i drew one more card and it was a ace of swords Hmm. Uh, which she said signifies strength. Um, so again, I, I don't really know what I make of that, um, but that's what happened. And then I also asked with that that you would uh, see if it was easier to read cards during yes, Halloween. Yes, yes. I, I asked her, <clears throat> and and she said no, not particularly, that she's okay. noticed. Um the the difference that she said she sees is the quality of energy that she puts into the cards. What do you mean? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's that's uh, another uh, topic that I am not really sure what I think about it. But for some reason, okay. this this also is very ancient and is still around. Um. But the the best way I can think or or conceptualize it is you when you meditate, your best meditation comes when you really have a clear mind and you're like, you know, not thinking, right? Mm -hmm. You can likewise put that quality, that that same kind of quality into. Uh, when she had me bid, or she she tried to get me to put my energy into the cards, okay. that I think is what she's saying is like where the real art is in in getting a good reading. Hmm. I think I think that's what she was trying to say. So with having your cards read, even with your background and kind yeah. of being scared to yeah. steer away from it. Um, did you find that it helped you or enlightened you at all? Do you feel like <laughs> you were able to conquer a fear? Or, like, what did you feel afterwards, after having your cards read? Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I don't know what I think about tarot readings in general, but the real honest part of me says I was relieved. I was excited. Um, I was really glad that it didn't produce a negative result. I really do think a negative result would have scared me. Like if future, the card number three was the devil. <laughs> I mm. think I would have been a little off put. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know. I don't really know. Um, mm. We wound up not getting the house. So we'll never oh, really know. Oh, that's correct. I wanted to ask you. <laughs> Yeah, so, no, uh, somebody beat us to the punch. Somebody put an offer in before we Dang. did. Dang. So, anyway. 
We'll that never sucks, know, dude. I guess. <laughs> so in light of that, mm-hmm. what do you think of your cards now? Um, the question that I put was, what would happen if I were to move? And so are you going to stay a hermit now? Like, what? well, there's there's <laughs> there's probably um, an alternate reality where that happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Ooh, like that that is something that um, could have happened. Like, if for whatever reason I was able to move into that house, the cards, you know, would have fo- foretold that story. So, do you still feel like it was well worth having your cards read? Um, uh, it, it was. It was definitely. Know. It was a, a good experience. Um, hmm. <laughs> nothing bad happened, yeah. um, and it was interesting to see. So, hmm. yeah, I would. I would. I would call it a good experience. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I've ever. I mean, the closest I've gotten to foretelling of my future was playing Mash as a kid. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That game, that game. Yeah, I actually looked that up on Google, uh, Mash in general, and it seems like a lot of people's first Google search was, "Does Mash work?" And I was like, "What? What the fuck? Like, what? Are you serious?" um but yeah no like divination seems to uh, be a huge part of practicing Samhain and it seems like it still takes place today in um a lot of traditions within Halloween um I do know that like there was this one tradition that I was reading that the Celts felt like um if you wanted to see who your future husband was there were two ways to go about it so one was you peel an apple and then you throw the peel behind your back and then you look back and whatever shape that apple peel fell into that was the first um oh what was it first letter of the man who you'd marry what his name would be and i was like huh what if that like what (laughs) what that doesn't really make sense no, but that's something that they truly believed would foretell who their future husband would be. Was oh, this landed in the shape of an O. So so what's my future husband must be Oscar or what's what's the rule on the number of times you're allowed to peel an apple? Is it just the first I think time it was you just do once. it? Once, just one time. I think it was just once. I didn't read too into that because I was just like, oh my gosh, no this redos. Is like playing mash. <laughs> <laughs> There was a Sanka tradition where uh, females could look into a mirror during Samhain and they could see who their future spouse would be. But there was also a darker twist to it. Um, you played a you played risk. You were risking yourself at this point because one, you could see who your future spouse was, but you could also run the risk of seeing the devil. So, Ooh, that's yeah. A dark twist. So like, there's. Yeah, and that's the, that's the thing with Samhain. You don't know what you're going to get. You don't know if you're going to get something on the darker side and or could it be something where you're blessed for the rest of the year, you see your future spouse, you're able to communicate with your ancestors that have passed on. Um, it seems like you just kind of flip the coin. Hmm. And I don't know, I feel like that's a really cool part about the, the tradition, you know. Um, or the celebration of Samhain. Um, something that really struck a chord with me was how other cultures and civilizations had similar celebrations. Um, I was looking into it to see if it was just something the Celts practiced, you know, Samhain, and mm-hmm. then the later Irish immigrants during the what was it 1800s into 1900s when they when they came over um brought with them or if it was something that several cultures civilizations believed in and like i uh mentioned before the uh, mesoamericans um they also had similar beliefs with their um the day of the dead or the dia de los muertos and that was back 3,000 years. And again, the Christians celebrating their All Saints, All Souls Day. Mm. Um, 
and it wasn't um, a Buddha. Uh, what, what, what did I say before? I can't even remember. Oh, Hinduism. But um, yeah, it was Hindu. Um, there's the Diwali festival within the Hindu um, calendar, and it's also their New Year. And they also believe that um, the lights. So they 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 light lanterns and stuff and they Mm -hmm. and they brighten their homes they believe that it's a significant point in the year because and it's also celebrated right around Samhain um they believe it's a significant time of year because that light is victory over evil it's good over Mm. evil um victory of light over darkness and knowledge knowledge over ignorance um, so within d- the Diwali tradition, it's light is a metaphor for knowledge and consciousness in the celebration. And I thought, I think oh, that's, that's cool. really interesting. Yeah. And within the Diwali traditions, they don't dress up in animal skins or darker things to ward off evil spirits. They adorn themselves with their finest clothing and I they would light like, up their homes. I would like celebrating that one. That sounds like good fun to me. <laughs> yeah. I actually, uh, on Snapchat today saw... Um, I don't use Snapchat very often, guys. I really don't like it. But I'm looking for a Halloween costume idea. Um, (laughs) And there was a a girl, an Indian girl, who was showing off um, how to create the the perfect Diwali festival look. And it was so beautiful because she had, like, dark, like, ruby red lipstick and, like, gold uh, glitter on her eyelids. And she was beautiful really beautiful but it seems like even though their tradition is a little bit different from Samhain there's still that similarity and Mm -hmm. I think that's what's Mm -hmm. beautiful about this tradition you know we may celebrate it very differently today with Halloween in America and um, other countries but there's something that try that ties us back to the festivals of old, and I, I just love it. Um, so I guess this would be a really good place to wrap things up. Possibly this is the best part about living in the here and now. We can look back at the world of old, learning from our rich history, that we aren't so different after all. And with the southern modernity of living in the social media craze, we can see that we still share many similarities, one with another. Um And maybe that's why we look forward to celebrating Halloween or holidays such as Halloween, because it ties us back to our ancestors, but it also ties us to the rest of different parts of the world. It ties us one with another. So those Mm. are my thoughts. I like that. I like that. I would I would say that uh, you scored a uh, a nice point with me for the the pro the pro side of the Halloween argument. I like that. I like that. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah cool no i think it's it's how you look at it um whether it be the good side you know if you want to look at it through the lens of diwali or Samhain, halloween um whatever makes you happy but it is something that goes back into the roots of early civilization and humanity and i think it's important to remember sure yeah i like that that's cool well <laughs> done thank you for researching all that that was a lot yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, okay, guys. Thank you for joining us today on Notion Club. Find us on the medias, giving us a like, maybe a comment of encouragement. Hit subscribe if you're new to the show. And let us know what you think. Thanks, guys. Peace out, bitches. Bye. <laughs>